All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, and we will walk through verses 20 through 36. In the first part of the passage, we will see Peter confess who the Lord Jesus is, and then in the end, or toward the end of the passages, we'll see where the Father confirms who the Lord Jesus is. So let's begin in verse 20, and let me read down through verse 36. Then Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ or the Messiah of God. And Jesus strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul or himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. What did he mean by that? Well, it's explained in the very next verses. Now, about a week, or Luke says, eight days after saying these things, he took with him Peter, John, and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory as well and spoke of his departure, which he was about to fulfill or accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory, the kingdom of God, if you will, and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents or tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid or gripped with fear as they entered into the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our family of faith here that you have brought together. Thank you so much, Father, for this unique time that we find ourselves in proving day after day your faithfulness to us, Father. We praise you for that. We praise you for yet another opportunity to gather in prayer and in worship and in song and in the preaching of your word, Father, and celebrate life that we have in Christ. Lord, I I pray that your spirit would take every bit of this morning's service and sanctify it, make it suitable, uh, a perfect offering in your sight, Father, in which to be glorified. And I pray that likewise your spirit would take your word and pierce our souls and make us more like Christ as we go along. So help us now, Father, in the preaching of your word to manifest the Son and make us more like him again. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Last week, we looked at how the disciples finally understood who Jesus was here in this scene, but they did not understand what all that would mean or what that would entail following their profession. For Jesus, it meant clearly that being the Messiah, he would go through great suffering, rejection, and then finally death. But for the followers of Christ, it meant much the same thing, as they would in turn pursue a life of self-denial, taking up their cross daily, and following in the very same path that Jesus walked while he lived here on earth. Now, obviously, we've got a lot to talk about in 23 through 26 with deny yourself and take up your cross daily. 
They are without question some of the greatest words, if not the greatest words that we have in Scripture that defines clearly what it means to follow Jesus Christ or what it means to be a true follower. But these passages are not about us. They're about the Lord, and we have to continue following along the Lord's sermon here, not ours. And Luke brings us to the climactic point of this question that he's been stringing along. Tyler's got a slide for you so you can kind of see the outline of Luke's flow here. First came the people's confusion in verses 7 through 8. Some say John, some say Elijah, some say an Old Testament prophet. And then he moves to Peter's confession. I know who you are. You are the Christ of God. And then we walk through the Mount of Transfiguration and we come to the Father's confirmation in 935 when he speaks, this is my son. This is the chosen one, right? Listen to him. So this is the path of Luke's sermon. This is the important sermon that we need to see. But you also need to reflect back about the last time the Father spoke about the Son. Do you remember where that was? Is that his baptism, right? Jesus came up out of the water and the Father said, You are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And that statement set Jesus' ministry in motion. Now here we are, way past halfway of the ministry, probably looking toward the last year of ministry, and we hear the Father speak again. This is my Son. Literally, this is the Son of mine, the one forever chosen to Him. Listen. And now when the Father speaks, it sets the climactic moment of the cross in motion. So the first time the Father speaks, sets the ministry in motion. The second time the Father speaks, He sets the cross in motion. And then we come to the understanding about what it means when we speak. Do you realize that what you say about the Christ sets eternity in motion for you? And I'm not talking about what you say with your mouth. I am talking about what you say with your life. It sets all of eternity in motion for you. But first, we have to look at this Mount of Transfiguration because really that's what flows from what we talked about last Sunday. Again, I'll show you once we get through the Mount of Transfiguration... These passages that we wrestle with is insignificant compared to the whole flow of the text. Now, when we talk about the mount, Scripture never tells us exactly where this took place. It's just church tradition that it was Mount Tabor, T-A-B-O-R. Origen was the first recorded to say that particular mountain, and he said it in the third century. On Mount Tabor, there are two churches today. There is the Mount, or rather the Church of Transfiguration, which is a Roman Catholic church. And then there is another church beside it. It's the Greek Orthodox Church. That's the church that we would consider to be the faithful one. Now, it was on this particular mountain that Peter, John, and James had an extraordinary experience of seeing the Savior in His glorified form. If you remember, it was just those three men who saw the little 12-year-old girl raised from the dead. And the Lord once again just sets these three particular men aside to be able to see a glimpse of the kingdom of God and the Savior in His glorified form. But all of it begins with prayer. And I've mentioned that every week. The Lord's prayer precedes critical moments in the Gospel of Luke. And here, Jesus praying precedes the moment His countenance was changed. Now, what that means in my mind, I've got some idea about how Moses appeared when he came out of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And you'll remember from Sunday school or vacation Bible school, his countenance was so that he had to put something over his head to hide this glowing thing that was going on because he had been in the presence of God. But here, God, God's son was transfigured or his countenance was filled with glory. The Bible says his clothing was dazzling white. The word is literally ex ostrapto, which means lightning. Now, you think about if you've ever seen lightning in some form where pictures have been uh, altered with time. There's the time delay and there's this brilliant brightness or this whiteness that is very difficult to look at. That's the word that Luke uses to describe the Lord Jesus and his appearance. It was so burning, bright, white, hot. It was almost unable to look at, or they were almost unable to look at it. Whatever it was, I'm sure Luke struggled with words when he wrote down that particular word, but it was Jesus 
having been transfigured into his glorious form. Now, there were two men with him, Moses, and you think about this, Moses who represented the law, and then Elijah who represented the prophets. Now, why those two men? Well, if nothing else, certainly this, it demonstrates how there is one consistent thread that flows from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's always been about the same thing. It's always been about the Father pointing His people to the Son. And so from Moses all the way to the Messiah, the truth holds the same. But there is a little bit of an understanding for us here. If Moses and Elijah appear in glory, who are two regular men, we too understand that we will one day appear with glory as well. Hopefully, many of us will look much better than we do now. But one day we will appear in glory just like Moses and Elijah. The three talk about something that is interesting. They talk about what is going to take place in Jerusalem. And Luke uses a word. We translate departure, but it's literally the word exodus. Matthew, I mean, rather, Moses and Elijah and Jesus talk about his departure, which could have meant everything he was about to accomplish. His death, his burial, his resurrection, even his ascension was about to be fulfilled at Jerusalem. But I think when he uses the word departure or the word exodus, he's speaking primarily about his death. When Peter uses the very same word in 2 Peter, he talks about his departure, meaning his death, his passing from this world. So I think primarily that's what he's talking about here when he talks about his exodus that was about to be accomplished. Now, the reason Luke uses the word, I think he's intentionally trying to draw a picture for us, at least a a word picture, a mental picture, When we think about Exodus, we're back in the Old Testament where the children of Israel are delivered or set free from the bondage that they were in Egypt. And in a very like manner, the death of Jesus is our Exodus where we're about to be set free or delivered from our bondage to sin and death. And that may be the very reason why Peter saw death as an Exodus. Peter was about to finally, in 2 Peter, be set free from this body that's constantly wrestling with sin under the power and the presence of sin. So nonetheless, we get the understanding the death of Christ will deliver us and has delivered us. Now, here's the sobering point. Peter, John, and James almost missed the entire thing because the Bible literally says they were heavy with sleep. Now, You think about that for a little while. I'm afraid that might be the case with the church. I wonder how much glory we've missed because we've been heavy asleep or at least greatly distracted as we are today. There's so much more we could have seen if we would have been alert and sensitive to the Spirit and what He was doing. So anyway, our Lord has to tell them after the fact what has taken place because they missed much of the experience. When they finally do awaken, they see before them three men standing before them in all their glory. So you have three asleep and three that have been transfigured into their glorious form. Moses and Elijah and the Lord Jesus. Now Peter must have been one of those people who is very uncomfortable or uh, just can't be content with silence because he pipes up and wants to build three tabernacles or three tents in the midst of this. Now, when Peter says this, Moses and Elijah are walking away. And so if you want to preach a good allegorical sermon, I guess you could say that Peter wanted to continue in that moment or that mountaintop experience. But for whatever reason, what Peter said is insignificant. Mark even says this about it. Peter had no idea what to say. In fact, in the middle of what Peter was saying, the cloud comes in and cuts him off and he falls silent because they are gripped with fear. Now, the cloud is the moment you need to get. It's the most significant moment. It says in verse 34, as he, Peter was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. A cloud which would represent the presence of God. Now you need to immediately go back and think about all the times the cloud descended And it was the presence of God. We remember Mount Sinai when the law was given and the cloud rested on the top of the mountain. We remember when the tabernacle was finished as the Israelites built or constructed the tabernacle 
in the desert and the tabernacle was filled with the cloud of God or the presence of God. Likewise, when Solomon finished the temple, the cloud descended. That's the most interesting moment. It's in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10. It said, It happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And so it is the cloud that represents the presence of God. When the cloud came, Peter fell silent and they heard the voice from the cloud speak, which said, this is the son of mine, the one who is forever chosen when he speaks. Listen, that's my translation. Luke's trying to put emphasis where he does. It literally reads, this is the son of mine, the one who is forever chosen when he speaks, listen. That's the turning point of the whole Bible. The chosen one, the son of mine, the long-awaited promise, the Messiah. All of Scripture has been carrying us along, leading to us to this moment. It's been progressive revelation since Genesis 3. Remember Genesis 3 is where man fell and the Lord spoke to the serpent and this is what He says in 3.15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed singular. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. What began in Genesis culminates here in Luke 9. We don't understand the anticipation. We don't get the expectation because 2,000 years have passed and we miss the fact that God has progressively been bringing His people along to go, here He is. This is my Son. We take all of that for granted because we know the name of the One who became a man. We know the name of the Son of God who laid aside His glory in order that He might die so that we might live. Do you have any idea how blessed you are to sit there and know the name? The only name under heaven given to men by which you must be saved, and you know the name. And you think about all the billions of people on this planet who have no idea of the name. And yet you and I know the name. How blessed you are just to know His name. The Lord says in that moment, Something extraordinary as well. He says to him, listen. Putting emphasis on the listen. In other words, pay attention to everything that he says. Which takes us all the way back to Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. What's going on there is Moses is preaching his last sermon series before he dies. And the children of Israel walk into the promised land. And speaking prophetically, Moses says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your own countrymen, and you shall listen to him. He goes on to say that the Lord says, I will raise up a prophet and I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of that man. Now, what does that mean? What is God going to require of us? what we did with what Jesus said. Jesus would say in John 12, He who rejects me does not receive my words or my sayings. He has one who will judge him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father Himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that His commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. You know what will be required of you one day when you stand before God? What did you do with what Jesus, my son, said? That's it in one sentence. Did you listen? Meaning, did you have ears that could hear? Did you hear the words of Christ and humble your heart and receive it wholly? Or did you reject the words of Christ? All eternity hangs on the balance of what you did with what the Son said. Now I have another slide here because I want you to see this. I know most of you spend quite a few hours in the Word of God. And so here is Luke's 
flow here. Tyler, if you'll go to the next slide. And I put this up here so you can see how Luke answers the question. It begins and ends with the question. This is the bookends, right? He is the Christ. He is the chosen one. Immediately before the Father tells us who He is, Jesus is talking about His departure or His exodus or His suffering that's going to take place in Jerusalem. After Peter's confession, Jesus begins to tell them, I must suffer, right? Be rejected and be killed. So the suffering goes next to the confession. But eventually, it all leads to glory. And that's what takes place in 26 and 27, where Jesus talks about Him coming in His glory the second time. And then when the transfiguration begins, Jesus appears in His glory. So if I gave you a test this morning and says, okay, who is this? But you must answer it the way Luke wants you to answer the question. You would say, He is the Son of God. First time He comes, He will suffer. The second time He comes... He will come in great power and great glory. This is the one that you must entrust your whole being to, your life. He will come, and He will come suffering, and then He will come in glory. And you have to realize this glory was hidden from everyone, but it was revealed to His disciples. Here it is revealed to Peter, James, and John, specifically on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they didn't talk about it. And then after Jesus was raised from the dead, it was revealed to the rest of the disciples who saw Him after He was raised. He asked the question, and I know you know this, but think about this. What became of our Messiah after He was raised? Paul tells us in Philippians 2, God highly exalted Him after He was raised. In other words, He was seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. So what Peter, John, and James saw that day was the glory of the Son. What we shall see when He returns is our Savior in all of His glory. Period. For those of you who have put your trust in Christ, you will share in that glory. And for those who have never trusted Christ, His glory will grip you with terrible fear. Luke's going to get to that in chapter 21. This is what he says in Luke 21, 25. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and the waves. People will be fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming upon the world. The powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So Peter... James and John got to see it that day. The rest of the disciples got to see it the day after He was raised from the dead. But you and I have this promise. We have glimpses of glory along the way. We have a uniqueness, a unique closeness with the Father at specific times in our life. But they're just a foretaste of what is to come. One day, you and I will stand and we will witness our Savior in all of His glory. But that's not right now, and that's not today. Today, our experience is the same experience that He had when the first time He came. Today, our experience is suffering and shame. But what is that compared to glory? What is that? Paul calls them them light and momentary afflictions. They're as nothing Nothing. The span of our life, 80 years, right? And if every day is spent suffering for God's glory, that is absolutely nothing compared to what you will see because you are willing to follow Christ. You will never consider one moment of suffering again because glory will have satisfied your soul for all eternity. So glory is ahead. But again, where does that put us now? Somewhere in between suffering and future glory. I've got a slide here for you, and you'll have to find the us for us if Tyler can go to the next one. There's where you are. You find it? It's so fitting that our experience in this life is one of suffering and shame and humility with just brief glimpses of future glory along the way. That's exactly where we find ourselves now until Jesus returns. 
You see, these passages, I mean, they're going to mean a lot to us in 23 through 26, but in the grander picture, they're insignificant compared to the glory of the Son of God. But we've got to deal with them. So what exactly does it look like in the here and the now for someone who truly follows Christ? What will their experiences be? Look with me in 923 and let me read with you. I think Tyler has this slide as well. 923 said, He said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. You've got three phrases that are immediately followed by three fours or three F-O-R's And all of them help us understand what it means to follow Christ. Now, I know why. It is frustrating, though. These are some of the most ignored passages in Scripture, even though they clearly describe the experiences of all who follow Christ. Can you imagine if this is the way we shared the gospel? If we brought somebody to the point of conversion and said, before you pray, hang on. I want to describe to you what you're getting yourself into. This is what this means. To follow Christ means you're going to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow Christ. That's what you're getting yourself into. I wonder how many professing believers we would have with that. These passages reveal to us the difference between those who have been converted by men and those who have been converted by the Spirit of God. Notice verse 23. Christ says this to all. Tell her back up just a little bit. Christ says this to all. Mark 8 would say this. He summoned the crowd with the disciples and said to them, if anyone would come after me. And the reason I bring that up is this is not a set of instructions for some elite group of Christ followers. This is not for missionaries or pastors. This is not some special forces division of Christianity. This is simply what it means to be Christian. This is for all those who, if you look at the first four in verse 24, all those that he's talking about saving life and not losing life. And by the way, that's from an eternal perspective. Following Christ is given in the three phrases, deny, take up, and follow. Again, this is discipleship in its easiest form. And I thought of this, see if you can follow my logic here. Salvation is clearly defined in Scripture as being in Christ. If I said anything in Ephesians, that's what I said. We are saved in Him. If we are then in Him, we have no choice but to walk with Him in this life. That's why I say, are you in Him? Well, here's how you answer that question. Do you walk with Him? Because if you walk with Him, then you must be in Him. Walking with Him doesn't make you in Him. That's done by grace. But walking with Him does prove without question that you are in Him. You cannot simply add Christ to your life. Being saved is not something we take care of. Salvation is something glorious that radically changes how you live. I thought, too, this morning, I really needed a chalkboard or a marker board to walk through this because I have no interest in preaching this. I, my only interest is in you understanding this because this is so very important for all of us. The first word that I want to start with is the word follow. Let's start at the end and back up. The reason being, follow is in the present tense, meaning this is the habit of your life. This is the pattern of your life. This is the way that you live. You follow Christ. And people who put their faith in Christ spend their lives walking right behind Jesus, who, by the way, leads our way down a path of humility and suffering. Two phrases are given to help us understand the word follow. And they're both from a negative 
deny, and to take up. Now these verbs are different. And in the Greek, that's significant, right? We're changing verbs. It's in the aorist tense. We don't have this in English, so just hang on for just a minute. Usually, when I say deny in an aorist, it would mean a single, one-time thing that you've done. But that's not what it means here. Sometimes aorist means a snapshot of your entire life. And here's where the conviction is about to swell up in your heart. From the aorist tense, Luke defines, or the Lord defines, following Christ as taking a snapshot of your life and saying, if I wanted to define their particular life, I would say since they came to Christ, they were a person who spent much of their time denying themselves and taking up their cross daily. Do you think about that from your perspective? If we took or we started from the moment that you professed Jesus and we just flew up over the remainder of your entire life and took a picture, in that picture, could someone look at that and go, absolutely. They lived as someone who denied themselves and took up their cross daily. That's the verb tense here. Now, what does it mean to deny yourself? Well, I think it's best to define that in a backward sort of direction because I know if I asked Rob this morning, Rob, how have you denied yourself? He might struggle to answer that question. I think all of us would struggle. How have I lived in a way that I have denied myself? But if I ask you this perspective, tell me how a lost man does not deny himself. I think you could answer that question a lot easier because a lost man cannot. He is absolutely incapable of denying himself. This is what it means from a lost man's perspective that he refuses to deny himself. A lost man is his own God. A lost man governs his own life. He lives by his own set of rules. He establishes his own way. He does what he thinks is best. He does whatever he sees fit. He listens to himself or whoever he thinks is wise, and then he forms his own way of living and doing. He's pre-wired this way. The lost man is self-centered, self-focused, self-ruled, self-led. He does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and he does it all to please himself. The lost man exalts himself. He pursues recognition, respect, and acceptance for himself from the world. That's what it means to not deny yourself. Now for the saint, none of that is true. Even though it is absolutely unnatural for the saint, and even though it cuts across the grain of his heart, the saved man denies himself, meaning he humbles himself. He rejects his own thinking, his own wisdom, his own insight. He rejects that for the Word of God where he has truly found the wisdom of God. He trusts in what God has said to meet his desires. The saved man sees God as the satisfier of his soul. God's word is the key to joy and satisfaction for him. He refuses to exalt himself, define himself, or even please himself apart from God and his word. This man is governed by, led by, instructed by, and ruled by God's word. This is what it means to deny yourself. It means to reject a life that is based on self-interest, driven by self-fulfillment, and motivated for self-protection. It is to trust God solely to provide, to protect, and to satisfy. That's what it means to deny yourself. When the Lord saves you, the single most powerful and influential thing that He saves you from is yourself. So, let me ask you from an aorist tense sort of perspective. Have you lived since you've trusted Christ in such a way that the Lord would define as denying yourself? Second phrase is equally as difficult. Take up your cross. What does it mean to take up your cross and do so daily? Now, you know the cross is a horrible picture of Roman execution. And it's interesting that this is the analogy that the Lord's going to use to define discipleship. That's bizarre. 
I'm going to use Roman crucifixion to define or describe what it means to follow me. Which speaks to me a great deal because no matter how cool, no matter how fun, how entertaining and enlivening we try to make the Sunday morning experience, following Christ is all about the cross. And there's nothing about that cool, fun, or funny at all. No matter how hard we try on Sunday morning, right? To draw people in and make it exciting. Jesus said, it's about the cross. That's what it means to fall. The cross reminds us of two things. One's literal and the other is spiritual. Literally, the cross was a sign of authority. Taking up the cross refers to, again, the Roman form of crucifixion in which the condemned man carried the crossbar on his shoulders to the place where he would be lifted up on that pole and crucified. To carry the cross was to put that condemned man up under the authority of Rome. For the believer, he willingly picks up that crossbar and places it upon himself and puts himself up under the authority of God. His life is one where his independence and his decision making is over. His life of dependence on God and his word has begun. The believer understands that he no longer has any say, any claim, or any authority over his own life. He has willingly submitted all rule and all authority of his life over to God. That's the literal picture. But there's a spiritual picture. The believer's willingness to share in the humiliation, the suffering, and the shame of Christ is signified by our willingness to take up our cross daily. And here's, it's very bizarre for us to live in this tension. We are people who live from victory to victory. We have gained victory over sin, over death. We have gained victory over the powers of the world and Satan. We live in that victory, but nonetheless, we willingly live as those who suffer, are rejected, suffer shame, and even die. We live in a bizarre tension, but willingly we put on the cross of shame because our Savior did. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 2, and Paul must have been meditating on the words of Jesus here. This is how Paul puts it in Philippians 2. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, But he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. He poured himself out. He took on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul had to be thinking about those words. It's the same picture. And Paul begins the whole thought with, have this attitude in yourself. Because our Lord Jesus had all the glory and He laid aside the glory. He made Himself of absolutely no reputation. He walked shamefully, humbly, and obediently all the way to the point of death. And the Lord says, to follow me is to do the same thing. Now Paul concludes with the glory side. He says in verse 9 of Philippians 2, For this reason God highly exalted Him. And you need to understand that's what your future holds as well. We will share in His glory. The believer understands that to truly follow Christ, he will continually take up his cross day after day, willingly to be rejected, maligned, taken advantage of, mocked, ridiculed, persecuted, all because we have sworn allegiance to Jesus Christ in His way, rather than allegiance to ourselves and to the world in its way. So that's what it means to follow Christ. Deny yourself and to take up your cross daily. Now, just so we understand, the Lord builds three fours around those three phrases to help us continue to process. Look at verse 24. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So that's what it's at stake when we talk about denying yourself and taking up your cross and following Jesus. We're talking about the difference between gaining life and losing life. And obviously the only way to have life is to have Christ. That's why John would say in 1 John 5, He who has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And so in the upside down wisdom of God, if you will, the only way to have life is to give it up and entrust yourself to Christ. Again, a lost man, he can't do this. He seeks for life, but he seeks for it in his own way. That's why the writer writer of Proverbs says this in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's the way of death. The man who has experienced grace refuses to trust himself or his own wisdom. He hears the Word of God and obeys. He forsakes this life for the sake of Christ, and in so doing, he finds real life or everlasting life. Now, when we talk about this verse, first four in verse 24, if you will think about it long enough, here's the immediate question that springs to mind. What becomes of the man that professes faith in Christ but continues to pursue his life his way? following himself in this life, yet hoping that Christ will lead him to the next life in glory. What becomes of that man? Of course, you know, we're talking about the man that fills the church. We're talking about the overwhelming majority of people that we know. I really can think of only one person in my life that tells me plainly, I don't know Christ. Everyone else, everyone else and I in my life tells me that they know Him. That man, according to Scripture, is self-deceived and headed for destruction. He arrogantly thinks he has stolen life from God's back pocket, and he continues to live this life his way. There is little to no hope for that man. The second four is also very interesting, very convicting if you'll spend time with it. What does it, in verse 25, what does it profit a man if he gains the world in all of its entirety? That's what it literally says. The whole world and loses or forfeits himself. Two things are on the table here. You've got your soul and you've got the world. And for the sake of the argument, the Lord poses the question, what if? Just just what if you could gain all the world's riches and pleasures? What if you could have For yourself, every single thing the world has to offer. Now, if you remember, the Lord Jesus faced this same temptation. Because in Luke 4, Satan took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And then the devil said to him, I will give you all of this, all of its domain and all of its glory. I'll give to you if you bow down and worship me. Of course, we know how the Lord responded. He was actually tempted with that. What if it could all be yours? And when you think about this, just this week, Elon Musk, the guy that owns the company that makes all those fancy little electric Teslas, he caught Bill Gates this week, and he's tied for second place. Musk and, and Gates' worth is at $128 billion with a B now. But they're just second. First place goes to Jeff Bezos of Amazon, 182 billion. Billion. You couldn't remotely spend that in 100 lifetimes. But the question that the Lord poses here is an offer much bigger than that. He says, What if all the world's wealth, all of its power, all of its pleasures as a whole belong to you? What if you owned a beach house on every shore, or for that matter, every beach house on every shore? What if you owned a cabin on every mountain peak? What if you owned every car of every color and every kind ever made? What if every square inch of this planet belonged to you, every thing or product every made, and what if every person was your personal servant? What if that was the state 
That's how big the Lord Jesus poses this question. And he says, if you took that, you would have forfeited your soul because my son is of much greater value than all of that put together. That's why Paul would say in Philippians 3, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And Paul says, I count them but dung or garbage so that I may gain Christ. I mean, literally, I hope at some point this sinks into your life. If the only thing in this life you ever possess is a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to understand you have it all. You have everything. But vice versa, if you somehow manage to gain every single thing in this life and have not Christ, in the end, you have absolutely, absolutely nothing. The last four. Verse 26, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Why would we ever be ashamed of the one who is truly the greatest treasure? Why would we ever be ashamed of the only one who can give us life? Why would we ever be ashamed of God's wisdom and God's Word? Why would we be ashamed of His Word that not only gives us life, but tells us how to live? And yet, how many times do we actually do that and are ashamed? Here it is, simply put, if the snapshot of your life is that you are ashamed of the Lord and His Word, in the end, you will not have life. I put this on a slide for you so you can see it as a whole. Life. Everybody wants it. Whether you know Christ or not, whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist, or whether you're an absolute lost man, everyone wants life, and everyone spends their life pursuing life. Now, most men, the vast majority, think that they found life in the world. They think that there's things in the world, there's possessions, and there's things that they can do that will satisfy their soul, the deepest longing of their heart. So what they do is they pursue this world and they cling to life. Because in that, they think they have found what they're looking for. But the one who knows the name, The one who has received grace looks away from the world and sees Christ in all of His glory and all of His value. And that person rejects the world even to the point of rejecting their own life and giving it over to Christ. They trust the promise of God that if you give your life to Me, I will satisfy every single longing of your life. In the Bible, there's always only two paths. It's in Psalms 1 and it's in the rest of the Bible. There's only two paths to pick. You can hold on to your life or you can give it to Christ and forsake your life. And in doing that, you will gain eternal life. Or you can pick the path that most choose and they go after the world. But there's only two paths. And if you're foolish enough to think that you can pull them both off, you're going to find yourself in the wrong path. And it's not going to lead you where you want to go. That's the saddest state because you fooled yourself. Now, I know you're deeply convicted and I've got three statements here that I want to make. Because when we consider the first part of this passage back in 23... Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. You need to understand, apart from the Spirit, that is absolutely not a possibility for you. And I'm not here this morning to heap or press guilt upon guilt upon guilt. That's nothing more than graceless or gospelless preaching. I might as well just recite the Ten Commandments and say, do this and live, and then send you out the door. 
That is not what Jesus is trying to do here. But if you have the Spirit of God, if you've understood the Gospel, then deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow Me is not only a probability, it will be a reality. For what God has begun in you, He will see that onto completion. It's what the Spirit is doing. The Spirit is leading you along in denying yourself. And the Spirit is leading you along in taking up your cross daily. And the Spirit is leading you along right behind Jesus. It is what the Spirit of God does. So we celebrate the fact that, yes, Lord, we can deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow you. Yes, from an aorist tense sort of perspective, when our life is said and done, the church could draw back and view us as an individual and see that's a great way to define how they lived because they trusted in Christ. So don't take this from a gospelless perspective or a graceless perspective. Don't heap this upon your shoulders and go out of here going, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. You can't. That's why Jesus had to die. But because He did and because the Lord did this perfectly, you and I can do this as well. So here we are. Last thought. Living in between suffering and future glory. We live a life welcoming suffering and rejection and shame to honor the One who died in our place. But we do all of that with great hope For the glory that He has, He will share with those who are found in Him. Again, here's how I think Paul would put this in just three verses. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so we set our eyes on those things and we deny ourselves and we take up our cross daily and we follow Christ knowing all the while that when we see Him, we will share in His glory. Let's pray.